Well, hi, everybody. I can see that uh, people are starting to filter in here. So we'll uh, wait a few minutes to, uh, to see how many people show up. We're getting the, it's always amazing to me that uh, just before these things happen, right on the button, uh, we start getting folks. Um, so I'm gonna wait another minute or so, and then we can, we can begin. Nice to see everybody. You can't hear anything. Can you hear anything now? Therese? Anyone? Hi there, everybody. Uh, how's the audio? Is it working okay? Or not? That's my question. And so I think Luca said they can. Okay, good deal. I'm ha happy to hear that. So let me uh, let me stop the uh, slides for a moment as people appear. Get a good number here. Um, so I'm going to stop for just a moment. And uh, hi everybody. Um, I'm Carl Binder, and I'm doing this solo today. Uh, I think we'll probably just uh, click right into the slides. And of course, hope hope you remember we're uh, recording this. And um, in about 36 hours, you'll get a, a uh, an email that has a link to the recording. So uh, let's get going here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart my slides. And we'll take it from here. So this, uh, so today's session is something I've been thinking about doing for a while, and we always uh, cover this topic in our various programs. And you can see the uh, the word counts, and we'll come back to that a little later. But uh, we, we could spend hours on the topic of uh, performance measurement, but we're just going to spend about an hour and uh, hopefully provide some insights and maybe uh, um, maybe change a few minds on some of the issues we we, we cover. Uh, I'm going to provide a little bit of context and background and a little bit of the usual housekeeping stuff about upcoming webinars and so forth. And then ask the question, which we often have a discussion about, but because this is uh, a webinar, I'll probably just ask the question and then answer it in the way that we typically do. Um, and then we're going to talk about some things that uh, we view as myths or malpractices or sort of misunderstandings about measurement talk about what can we measure, and then I think have some time at the end for Q&A if you want to engage uh, in the chat box. Uh, I want to just, this is the shameless commerce section, but you know, if you go to our website, performancethinking.com or sixboxes.com, and you go to programs and services, you see we have a quite a range of them where we leverage our same core models uh, for different people, whether they're leaders and managers, uh, coaches and supervisors, people in learning performance professionals of various kinds or individual contributors. So just be aware we have a range of programs for different folks. Uh, and also, uh, this is a big one for us. You know, we have had 10 annual summer institutes and they are fantastic experiences. Um, every, many people, it always surprises me, but any, many people report that they are the, quote, best professional development experience in their entire careers, unquote. Um, but last year, in 2020, we were unable to do it. We generally run these in June, and because of COVID, we just couldn't do it. Uh, and so this year, we had planned to uh, do our usual early June um, uh, event, but the venue, uh, Islandwood, which is a wonderful, uh, in, in most cases, environmental education place, but wonderful place with five-star meals, with really wonderful wooded uh, paths to walk and so forth. Um, we've, we've held some dates in early September. And I keep trying to ask, uh, uh, you know, do, you think, do people think they're going to be able to start traveling by then? And it's really kind of hard to tell. Uh, so um, we are, we have set the date September 12th to 16th. We will, you can go on our website uh, at performancethinking.com or sixboxes.com and you can see uh, information about what the tentative program is, uh, but we don't know for sure. 
However, I would really implore you, if you have any interest whatsoever in coming to beautiful Bainbridge Island and spending four days with uh, some wonderful colleagues, it's a small group, typically like 50 plus or minus, uh, at least put those dates, September 12th to 16th in your calendar, just in case we get to run it. We're hoping we can. And I, I'd, hope, I, I'd hate to have you, you know, schedule a vacation that weekend uh, and, and then not be able to... Uh, um, you know, not be able to uh, go because you had not set aside the time. So I just want to highlight that. Uh, we're also going to do a whole lot more webinars, of course. Uh, we do these monthly webinars, and see, these are some of the topics. Um, we're looking forward to focusing on how we add value when we um, do process work. Uh, we may, we're hoping, uh, not sure when exactly, but to do a webinar with our colleague, Peter Doms, who's a strategic planning guy, and we talk, want to talk about strategic plans for execution. And some other topics you can see. Next month, though, we're really excited. Uh, and you can uh, you can register for this one on our website if you want. But we're calling our webinar next uh, time, Aha! Insights from Performance Thinking. Because one of the things that we've uh, sort of learned and observed over the years is that um, when people go through our programs, or even when they just sort of encounter the models that we teach, um, it is often amazing how people have these kind of insights and they see things in ways that they've never seen before and they can be very transformative. And so what we're gonna do uh, next month is we're gonna have a, our colleagues, as you can see, these are senior folks in their respective areas of expertise. So they're not newbies. And we know, of course, our programs for managers or performance consultants and so forth for new people can be a fantastic on-ramp to being able to uh, do their work. But um, for experienced people, uh, you know, it's, uh, you say, well, is there anything to learn here? And these folks all will be, I think, reporting insights that are really paradigm shifting. Kathy Godlewski, who has uh, actually uh, wrote, written something about that, we're gonna have a guest a blog on our website in the next few weeks by her about this. She sort of led this. And uh, anyway, it's gonna be an exciting, I think, conversation. I'm gonna be really fascinated uh, as really the host or interviewer to see what people have to say. Um, also, uh, usually in these webinars, I spend a fair amount of time at the beginning providing an overview of performance thinking because although many of you have um, seen uh, you know, our webinars or our programs before, there are some people who have not. Uh, this time, however, is you'll see we're not going to really get into it. We're going to share one of our two models, the performance chain. But if you want to know more, uh, go to our YouTube channel, which you can get to either at performancethinking.tv or sixboxes.tv. It'll get you right there. And we put our webinars up there. There's also a whole bunch of shorter, um, uh, you know, three to five minute bits that you might find interesting. I'm going to uh, make a couple of documents available to you right now. Uh, these are things that they're not handouts in the usual sense, but they are um, documents that you might want to unload uh, or download rather. Um, you can get them. I believe you'll be able to see on the side of your screen now the place you can download them. Um, you can also, we have a resource library at sixboxes.com or performancethinking.com. And these are both published articles that you can download there too. But I thought I'd made it, make it convenient for you today because we are going to be talking about measurement. It's a couple of publications. Uh, one of them was in ISPI's monthly uh, publication, Performance Improvement, Measurement, A Few Important Ideas, which I think you might find interesting. It will track much of what we talk about today. And then the second one is a chapter in that book, in the handbook of improving performance in the workplace. You won't be downloading the whole book, but my chapter in it, uh, I think you might find interesting. It also talks about some of what we're gonna discuss today. So uh, feel free to download those. Um, I, I also wanna learn a little bit about you. And so I'm gonna actually uh, go to a poll right now. And um, I will make this poll live in a moment. But what I'd like you to do, uh, hopefully, you can see the poll now. And what I'd like you to do is select the role that most fits your job, that most fits what you do. So performance consultant, not a surprise. We've got a performance consultant or two, I would bet. Uh, are there others here? I'm curious. Uh, uh, please, please uh, select the item in the poll that is most uh, relevant. Other, so I don't know what the other is, but we'll maybe find out. Um, 
a lot of the folks that come to us are training professionals of one kind or another. Um, quality and process improvement, that's very interesting. We're going to, um, you know, measurement is relevant to all of these things, of course. Leaders are managers, absolutely. Everybody in these roles certainly um, uh, benefits from measurement. And uh, uh, I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering if my audio is still okay. I'm, uh, it's acting in my ears, though it might not be. So uh, anyway, we've got a mix here. I'm going to end this poll. Looks like just about everybody filled something out. Looks like we've got more performance consultants than uh, anything else, um, but a bit of a mix. So that's quite interesting. So the audio is still working. Okay, good deal. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate the feedback you, you provide. It's quite helpful. Um, so let's keep going. I want to tell you a little bit where I'm coming from. Uh, some of you, I know some of you quite well. Uh, you may know that I was one of uh, B.F. Skinner's last students. B.F. Skinner was a, a behavior scientist, really. He created a new behavior science in the 30s when he uh, did his initial work. Um, and then, of course, he became known as the behaviorist and published a lot of work uh, in different books and publications and had an enormous impact voted by the American Psychological Association as the most impactful psychologist of the 20th century. And I had the good fortune of studying with him at Harvard in the uh, last couple of years before he retired. And this book, Skinner on Measurement by another of my mentors, Ogden Lindsley, captures uh, a lot uh, of the underlying principles that we'll be talking about today. But what I want to point out is that many people think of Skinner as having discovered a whole bunch of things like things about reinforcement, discrimination learning, or program instruction. And those are all important things. But he said himself in an interview in 1968 that his most important contribution was measurement, what he called rate of response or behavior frequency. In other words, count over time of behavior. Because that was, like in many areas of science, where a measurement technology enables a whole lot of discoveries, that was the foundation for everything that he and his subsequent followers, disciples, protégés, and students created. And so I come from that tradition, and I worked for 10 years in a laboratory where we did instructional design, where we did laboratory work, and then since the early 80s, I've been working in companies. Uh, but this really is the foundation, and you'll be hearing about counting and timing, and you'll see a few examples, really, that are direct applications of Dr. Skinner's uh, perspective. So that's where I'm starting from. Um, I wanted to begin with just the, the question, why do we measure? And when, um, when we have our workshops and when we do our programs, we usually have a fairly uh, thorough discussion of this. But I've sort of summarized this uh, actually since the late 70s when I started training teachers and instructional folks as saying that there's really three fundamental reasons if you, if you boil it down. The first one is validation. And validation is often associated with things like uh, publication or programs that are presented to you know, the world or the marketplace as evidence-based or proven. Uh, claims of validity, uh, people who develop recipes in, in certain ways, you know, tools and methods that they then measure and they say, see, this works. Now, the thing that's interesting about validation type measurement is a lot of times people measure the effects of a thing and then maybe they publish it or they make it, you know, known. And then the people who adopt it say, well, this has been proven or validated, so we don't need to keep measuring. And I would argue with that, but that is one of the core reasons that people do measure things. When they talk about evidence-based practices, for example, in various fields, a lot of times they're talking about uh, recipes or methods or models or procedures that were measured, proven to be effective, and now people use them often without very sensitive measurement. The second reason that people often measure is for what I would call accountability. And of course, the word accountability is a big one in, uh, in a lot of areas, in management and performance improvement and so forth. A lot of times it's, it has a kind of a negative uh, vibe, you know, sort of like, oh, we'll hold you accountable, you know. But the notion is um, uh, that people collect data, whether it's for regulatory reasons or for other reasons, where they can say, yep, we've got the data, you know, we've got you covered. Our, we, we can, we, we've got the information. We can prove this, that, the other thing. Uh, and usually, or very often, uh, those kinds of data are someplace in the files or the database. They aren't necessarily displayed and used on a regular basis, but they're data collected for the sake of accountability. And the third reason, oops, the third reason 
uh, is what I would call decision making. And what I mean by that is we collect data, whether we're whether we're business leaders or managing or leading things, or whether we're performance consultants or training people or process people, whatever our jobs are, uh, we're trying to find out, is this working or not? You know, how quickly is it working? Is it is change happening rapidly enough or do we need to do something different? You know, have we reached the goal yet? Uh, should we continue with this or do we need to try something else? Was it worth it? Those are all kinds of questions that fundamentally beg uh, answers that are about decisions. And what I've always contended, and I believe it's true, is that if you have a measurement methodology or measurement plan or a set of you know measures that will support making decisions, effective database decisions, then you're collecting data that will be good for accountability in most cases, and will also often prove over time the effectiveness of some procedure or methodology or whatever. So I always say that for most purposes, and certainly in the performance improvement world, um, uh, we're really talking about uh, about decision making in the end. So um, that's just kind of a framework for thinking about why we measure. What I would like to do now is talk about some things that maybe are a little controversial, maybe not, but they're kind of uh, some things that I think are not always well understood in the measurement world. And so I've referred to them as myths and mal mal malpractices. Um, this is one of my favorite quotations. Dr. Penny Packer, who's one of my mentors, and he's still, he's, he's Professor Emeritus from the University of Florida, but he's been a profound in, influence on me. He's a great behavior scientist. He also uh, um, founded a company that made huge impact on um, uh, self-examination of breast cancer. He's done a lot of things. He was an important contributor to precision teaching. But in the instructional world, I love this uh, quotation of his from a presentation he did some years ago, where he said, percent correct is just one step above rumor. And that's a pretty kind of strong and mildly funny statement. Let me show you a little bit what that really means. It's, we pretty much all of us have pretty much grown up in a percent correct world. From if we were ever in educational environments or training, given tests or assessments, usually percent correct was the way it was assessed. And frankly, I would argue that by and large, we don't think about it. We don't know much better. And so if you look in the training world, an awful lot of measurement is using percent correct. But there's some challenges with that. And I want to show you some data that I and my colleagues collected in our classroom and laboratory in the late 1970s, if you can believe it. And this is when we, I was working in a laboratory and some of our students were uh, severely uh, disabled, intellectually disabled uh, uh, residents of a state school, the Fernal State School in Massachusetts. And we were teaching them uh, really in a program instruction way, but also using some other methodologies. We were teaching them pre-academic and pre-vocational skills. And so if you look across the top there, you'll see what those skills were, putting pegs in a pegboard which is just a fine motor skill, uh, copying printing strokes or numerals or one, writing one zeros, dashes, sevens, fours, and nines, different numbers that are more or less complex uh, as, a, as a simple thing to write. Saying the names of pictures, saying, saying numerals, naming numerals, in other words, four, seven, three, et cetera, from a piece of paper. Rote counting, which is just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Uh, putting tiles into a can, which is a, just a fine motor uh, move, movement, putting tiles into a can, counting tiles into a can, which is counting while moving the, the tiles in one word correspondence, and then counting out tiles from a set. Really, really, really simple uh, um, behavior. So we had three groups of people. We had our state school institutionalized people between 12 and 54 years old. We had some little kids in regular public schools between five and seven years old. And we had some adult professionals and colleagues who had master's or doctoral degrees. And if he, and and what we're measuring here is correct responses per minute. Now, uh, what you'll see if you look at those bars, those are the ranges for the three groups, is on, on almost every one of these skills, all of the adult professionals had more correct per minute responses than all or most of the regular little kids than all or most of the state school students. And this this would not be a surprise. If you met these people, if you saw them in a room, if you saw them out walking across the parking lot, 
uh, you would say, yeah, that kind of corresponds to sort of what these f folks look like in terms of their general competence. But this is this is their skills in uh, in, in academic world. However, uh, they were all accurate. These people didn't make any mistakes. So if we looked at them on a percent correct scale, they all look the same. Now, let that sink in for a moment. This means that we are working and have been working since we were in kindergarten and perhaps professionally now are working in a world where the measurement system we used cannot distinguish between, you know, a, a, a severely disabled person in an institution and the performance of a person with a PhD. So essentially we're blind when we use percent correct. We cannot distinguish between the performance of a person with severe intellectual disability and the performance of a person with a graduate degree. So that's a problem. And it's one of the underlying problems in the field of education. It's why uh, those of us who have been involved in the field of precision teaching and fluency-based instruction, which I brought into the corporate world also, where we look at the time dimension, actually see differences and we can set goals that are very different than just accuracy. Now, continuing on that percent correct thing, I wonder, I'm sure we've all taken multiple choice tests. And you ever get 100% on a multiple choice test? Probably, or maybe not, but you probably did well on some. But the thing about percent correct, if that's what we're looking at, is that first of all, we don't know how many times you responded. If you get 100% on something, does that mean there were 10, 10 items or 100 items? We don't have any idea what the count of items is when we just look at percent correct. And similarly, we have no idea how long it took. Now, I've been a little bit, you know, assertive here in the second bullet here about how long it took you to guess, because we all know, in fact, uh, people who prepare for things like graduate record exams or SATs know that if you practice um, to move through these items quickly, and if you look at the ones that you know for sure and mark those off, and then you take the ones that you don't know for sure, and you say, well, it's probably not this one, it's not this one, it maybe one of these two, and then you guess. Now, that guessing takes time as opposed to just looking at it and knowing exactly what the answer is without having to go through that. But percent correct can't tell us that if we didn't involve the time. So we can't even, again, tell a difference on the way many of us assess people uh, because we don't look at the time dimension. And to get sort of nerdy about it, that's because percent is a dimensionless quantity. That is when you take the number of correct items over the total number and you cancel it out, you, you do the division problem. You now have a ratio, but you've gotten rid of the units of analysis, so-called, the, the actual count of responses. So that's very interesting. Now, here's another one about percentage that you might find interesting. So, so what happens if you add 20% to 100? Well, you can do the math. You get 120, right? So 100, you increase it by 20%, you get 120. What happens then if you try to go backwards and subtract that 20% from 120? What do you get? Well, you get 96. Now, did you ever notice that before? I hadn't until maybe 20 years ago when somebody pointed out to me, but it's sort of one of those holy cow moments where you say, wait a minute. So kind of what are we counting then? Like what's, if, you know, if you, if you can add this and then subtract it and it doesn't come up to the same thing, you realize that percentage is not actually an absolute or standard measure. It's a ratio that again is missing dimensions. Now let's go a little further than this. Let's look at this outside the context of, um, of uh, excuse me, I, I, my Air, AirPod dropped out of my ear. Let's look at this in the context of business data. So for example, in this last year, here's two companies, two very successful companies, Apple and Stripe. Like who grew faster? Well, in 2020, it turns out that Apple's growth in revenue was about 5.4%. But Stripe was about 25%. So that's pretty impressive, huh? But the thing is, if you look at the actual counts, you notice that, well, of course, Apple was going from 260 billion to 274 billion. So they actually increased their revenue by $14 billion. Whereas Stripe went from 2 billion to 2.5 billion. So they increased their revenue by a half a billion. 
Now, we all know that smaller startups often tend to grow faster than larger companies. But if you just look at the percentage correct, you can't really tell, or percent, you can't really tell. So uh, here's another, yet another example. Let's say this is uh, in a manufacturing environment and we are producing widgets and you got some good widgets and some defective ones. Now notice the pattern on that graph because uh, the whole thing is going down. The number of widgets per hour, the productivity is actually decreasing. Both good ones and bad ones are getting slower. And yet the ratio between the good ones and the defective ones is expanding. So you would say the quality is increasing. So again, if you don't know the actual counts, you can't really see the whole picture. Um, so here's another, uh, here's another, uh, so, 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 so that's worth considering, let's put it that way. And um, uh, one of our recommendations that I think is in a slightly later slide is, if you're going to do ratios, or if you're going to do percentages, also show the, the actual numbers, the actual counts, because you'll not really understand what you're looking at otherwise. But here's another one. And again, people who've been through our programs are familiar with this, but um, lots of people use rating scales, technically Likert scales. But what I would argue, uh, sort of playing off the first, uh, the first uh, George Bush uh, president who used to talk about voodoo economics, I would say that Likert scales tend to encourage voodoo math because this is what we usually do. We get a whole bunch of reviews or we, let's say we do a smile sheet in a, in a class or we have people rate something and we say, Oh, there's a whole bunch of fives and fours and threes and twos. And we add this all up and then we divide it by the numbers and we get in this case, 4.38. I used to have a friend who was a, a instructional person and a trainer and she used to talk about how she could improve her ratings by wearing a particular kind of, uh, of, of jewelry, <laughs> which is kind of amusing. But the problem is that's not real because these, technically speaking, this is an ordinal scale. This is not an, a ratio scale. So five is not five times better than one. It's actually categories. It's actually excellent, good, average, below average, and poor. And it's what one of my colleagues and mentors used to refer to as refined opinion, because you actually can't add, subtract, multiply, or divide these numbers meaningfully. So that number is just a meaningless number. However, we could do it like Amazon. If, if you shop at Amazon, and these days any place else that has reviews of things, you will see that not only do they give you the ratings, but they tell you how many people rated the thing as a five, as a four, as a three. Now there you got something to count because now you're counting people who rated this as a five, four, three, two, or one. Now this, this is not the best example for what I'm about to say. A lot of times I will go to a review on Amazon or someplace else. I'll say, oh, there's a whole lot of fives and fours. So people really like that. There's also a whole bunch of ones. What's going on with that? So I will open up the ones and I'll see what people say. And sometimes it's because they don't like the color or there's something that has nothing to do with my interest in this product. And so the ones are not a problem from my perspective. Other times they are. The point is that when we're actually counting and looking at people who rate us a particular way, we can investigate the actual thing instead of saying, well, we got a 4.78. That's pretty good, which doesn't actually mean anything. So uh, in fact, um, one of my colleagues uh, who we did a webinar with a couple of sessions ago, Matt Linder, uh, we were, I was working with him when he was the chief operating officer, executive vice president of a company, and we introduced this and he immediately changed uh, their rating scale stuff to uh, actually counting up how many people rated you a certain way. That's real measurement. That's not voodoo math. And in fact, as I say, this looking at it this way may lead us to check out the ones and fives and try to understand what we're looking at. So that's, so these are some of the kind of uh, myths and issues. Um, one of the things that also comes up is how often can you measure? Because, for example, I'm sure you're familiar with things like pre-tests and post-tests, or people look at what the numbers were now, then they run sort of intervent some kind of intervention or program, and they see how they are later. But the thing is, how often are you getting data? Are you measuring hourly or daily or weekly or monthly or quarterly? Because the less frequently you measure, the less likely uh, you're going to be able to really see what's going on. Because you might ask, well, what difference does it make? As long as we see what 
the you know the baseline was before we intervened in the act and what happened afterwards isn't that enough but i'm sure everybody especially if you follow the stock market or various other things knows that sometimes there's a trend sometimes thing something is already going up or it's already going down or sometimes it's highly bouncy or variable data so the question is if i had a pre-measure and then i had a post measure does that post measure look good because it was actually an improvement because or was there already a trend going on so that what we did didn't actually make any difference the trend just continued or maybe we got a data point that was an up bounce so a really important question for you to consider is how often can you gather data because if you can't get data very often let's say quarterly or monthly you may not be able to make timely decisions about whether to change what you're doing or improve it or or do some error correction or whatever it is so that's a really important consideration how often you can measure now here's the one that i want to kind of bring up and uh this this may be the may, may be the more controversial topic here although I had a colleague the other day who I said, I'm going to talk a little bit about Kirkpatrick stuff. And she said, oh, I always like to see a little Kirkpatrick bashing, which was a little stronger than uh, I had in mind. But anybody who's in the training and development world probably is familiar with Kirkpatrick's levels of evaluation. This framework has been around for a long time. And, um, and most of the people that I know in the training world know about it. And most people, uh, an awful lot of people, when I go into a new training and development uh, department and I'm speaking with them about their practices and so forth, and I say, well, how do you measure stuff? And they say, well, we do reaction measures, you know, level one, which is we put out rating scales and we find out if people like the training. But of course, there's a fair amount of data to suggest that that has no ability to predict whether people learned anything. It's just whether they liked it or not. Um, and so then they'll say, and so then they say, well, we do measure learning. You know, we we have percent correct tests, pre tests, and post tests, and so forth. And I say, well, okay, but you know what? If you're just looking at accuracy, then you may not really have a measure of performance there because it doesn't have the time dimension. And then they say, well, we're striving for level three. You know, they're saying we want to do level three, but the question about that is whether level three is what it seems to be measure behavior and then results of course everybody would like to measure results so um, let's look at that a little bit more carefully as i mentioned kirkpatrick is widely known i just googled kirkpatrick model the other day and you know the google the, the first item that came up in google says the kirkpatrick model is probably the best known model for analyzing and evaluating the results of training and educational programs it takes into account any style of training both informal uh, or formal to determine aptitude, which I think is a rather odd word to use. It's not about performance, apparently. Aptitude seems to be more about whether you maybe know something, which, okay, maybe that's all right. But if you don't have the time dimension, it's a little weak. So let's look a little more carefully. I've already mentioned some of these things, but if you consider Kirkpatrick's levels, first of all, smile sheets or rating scales, as I said, don't really predict learning. They tell you whether people liked it. And of course, we want to know that. If somebody hates your training, they're not going to engage in it. If they hate your intervention, you got a problem. So we do, would like to know about that. But it's surely not a measure of performance. And then the second thing is learning. Well, percent correct might be the way people measure that. Uh, and so the question is, it's not really a measure of performance. Uh, it's whether you were given often an unlimited amount of time or quite a bit of time able to answer a question or respond to a test now the third one behavior and this is what people always say well, well we're trying for level three and it's always a little bit shocking to me and maybe when we get to some q a time you guys might have some examples of this but um that are different but a lot of times i ask people well how you doing that level three thing and they say well you know, a month or so after the training, we go and ask the managers and say, do you think you think their behavior changed as a result of the training? Which is what, uh, I, again, another of my colleagues referred to as refined opinion. In other words, it's actually not a measure of behavior. Um, behavior is hard to measure because you gotta watch people and it takes time typically. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. And then finally, results. Now, typically what people mean by that are, things like cost, quality, production, and so forth. And those are important, 
But again, as we'll say later, very often those are very lagging indicators. You don't get to measure those until quite a long time after sometimes you've intervened in some way. And so it's important to have those data, but the question is, can you make good decisions with them? So I view the Kirkpatrick's levels as sort of sounding good on the surface, but frankly, not very helpful when it comes to actually measuring stuff. So um, the question is, how if, if that's not working for you, then what will? And so that's where I want to sort of get into how we think about it uh, from the Performance Thinking Network's perspective. The first thing, and I want to emphasize this, and it's been implicit in what I've said so far, but also, of course, it is, uh, it is part of the title of this session, that fundamentally measurement is counting. It's counting things, whether it's dollars or widgets or responses to something or solutions or relationships or a proposal that are successful or whatever it is, it's counting things. And so the question that always comes up is, well, so, okay, wh what are we counting? Now, um, there's a slightly nerdy phrase, units of analysis that I take from my behavior science background. And I apply that as you'll see in, in our model called the performance chain. But if you're looking at something, what are you counting? What are the units? What, how are you analyzing this thing into its parts? And then what are the parts? And so that's really related to this question about what are we counting? And you know, what are the units of analysis in performance is, is another way to think about that. And you know, this I, I always like to show this slide because I love the picture. And I also like the statement, which is that all great truths begin as blasphemies. And uh, George Bernard Shaw in his pithy way. Well, uh, many of you who have a background in performance improvement probably know about Dr. Tom Gilbert, who was another one of my teachers and I knew him for some years as well as his partner and wife. And this book, Human Competence, as again, many of you probably know, had a really earth-shaking impact on the field of performance and, and learning and development because he said in it, in his typical iconoclastic way, because Tom really liked to upset the apple cart, he said, in the great cult of behavior, Behavior itself is viewed as an end rather than as a means to an end. And he wasn't talking about behaviorists. He was talking about trainers and leaders and managers and people who are looking at performance. He said, we must enable people to produce accomplishments, the valuable products of behavior. So in the, in the 70s, really a little earlier now, but in the 70s, certainly in following Tom Gilbert, but also uh, many of his contemporaries, um, you know, Gary Rumler, Del Brethauer, others who were early contributors to the field of performance improvement started to shift their focus from the behavior of people to the products of that behavior. And so in our work, we call those work outputs. And we, you know, Tom had a big influence on me in the 70s and 80s, and uh, this one was a big part of it. And so we have this model. This is one of our two models. And we call it the performance chain. It's very simple. But what we say is that the units of analysis and performance are anchored to work outputs, but they are behavior that produces work outputs that contributes to business results. So, and behavior influences are really not a part of performance. They're, they're the things that influence performance. So we can keep that there, but I've whited that out to make it clear that if we're looking at performance, the units of analysis are either what we would think of as organizational level business results, as you see there, some examples, things like revenue, profits, customer satisfaction, market share, employee engagement. Those are things that uh, typically the C level, the C suite of an organization, the investors, the executives will care about because they reflect the success of the whole organization. What Tom contributed in our phrase work outputs, we use instead of accomplishments because it for a whole bunch of reasons, but just, you know, there's a reason we do this, which is that work outputs sound more countable than accomplishments do sometimes. But in any case, work outputs are the things that people produce, either individuals or teams or processes that contribute to business results. And in fact, they're only valuable to the extent that they do. And if you've got things like some silly form or some other thing that people produce, but you realize, wait a minute, this doesn't actually contribute to business results, you probably want to get rid of them. But as you'll notice, below work outputs, and we spend a lot of time in this in our programs, there's lots of kinds of work outputs. There's concrete things like deliverables. 
There's things like transactions, which are an exchange of things, typically like a sale or a loan or like that. But they're also less tangible things like decisions, relationships, and so forth. These are types of work outputs that we encourage people to identify when they're starting to analyze performance. And those are the valuable contributions that people make. And then we have, once we know what those outputs are, we can identify the behavior needed to produce them. So we can do task analysis, we can observe exemplary performers, we can do lots of stuff. But the point is we're now focused on the valuable behavior, ideally the exemplary behavior, the best practices behavior for producing the work outputs to contribute to business results. So this is one of the two models that we teach people. We teach it as a way to analyze performance, uh, as a way then to uh, redesign sometimes performance, and frankly, as you'll see, in a way to think about measuring performance. Because what I want to show you is an alternative to, to Kirkpatrick, um, and it's pretty simple. What we're going to say is that you can measure all three of those elements. So Michelle, I'm just noticing in the chat box and I haven't uh, seen that sheet. Um, could I say again the statement about uh, 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 when you're doing work that doesn't connect to results? So, so just let me clarify again. Behavior is the right behavior if it produces work outputs or accomplishments that are valuable and they are valuable to the extent they contribute to business results. Now, we're not going to emphasize all of that here. That's a whole nother conversation that you can you can go to our YouTube channel and see countless videos about this topic, and we teach this. But one of the important things um, about this is that when individuals or teams or processes produce work outputs, we can point to those and usually fairly credibly say, it's obvious that this form or this relationship or this decision or this widget contributes to something for the whole organization. And so actually that connection between behavior work outputs and business results is a powerful thing when we're working with people because we can say, the value of your behavior is that produced this important product, a relationship or decision or a widget or a you know, document, whatever it is. And notice it's not that hard once you know what the output is to link that up to something for the whole business that it contributes to. In fact, if you can't, if you can't say, that this output obviously produces something of value, you might question whether people should be spending their time on it. In any case, we can, of course, measure business results, and we usually should, but they are lagging indicators in most cases. Now, in some environments that I've worked in, let's say call centers, where there are things like solutions provided or first call resolutions that they're trying to get customer service representatives to produce, they will often have reader boards that are looking at that on an hourly basis. And so very often um, that, which is an output notice, uh, is at least, but it's also a productivity. If you look at productivity in the call center and you say, how are we doing? You know, are we, from a productivity point of view, how are we doing in terms of serving customers? You can think of the aggregate of all of those resolutions or solutions as, um, as being a productivity or business measure. And that may show up pretty often on some kind of reader board or, or, or feedback system. But most times, things like revenue, profit, customer satisfaction, employee retention, and so forth, are lagging indicators. And what that means is that you can't make decisions very often with them. Uh, we can also measure behavior, of course, and we do it. If we're involved in safety, for example, we want to measure, you know, did people put on their glasses? How did they lift the thing properly and so forth? If we're working with salespeople or customer service people, we can have checklists for the things that they should do. As probably, I'm sure some of you have probably worked in call centers where they record calls and then the supervisor and the customer service representative can sit down and review the call with a behavioral checklist. Yeah, it's really good the way you use the person's name and da da da. And that's important stuff. And it's really good for two things. It's one is for feedback, for periodic feedback where you say, yep, see, that's the right thing to do. And then this thing you could correct. It's also often good for diagnosis because if somebody is not producing, the relationship or the good proposal or the decision, if they're not producing the work outputs, then you can look at the behavior and say, hmm, what can we change here? Why aren't you being successful at this? But it's costly because usually in most contexts, you got to watch people. You got to observe people. You got to have some sort of a checklist. So it's an important thing, but it has its issues. However, 
we think work outputs or accomplishments are sort of the missing and highly underutilized link. Because notice, if we if we select the correct work outputs to, to monitor, uh, first of all, uh, we can do it informally during training or on the job. In our programs, for instance, um, we're looking at not how people are behaving, we're looking at can they produce good descriptions of work outputs? Can they produce complete analyses of a hunk of performance? Can they describe behavior in a way that's correct? In other words, it's not the describing, it's the description. And so um, we can define and count work outputs that meet criteria for goodness and not, even informally. So that, for example, in our practitioner program for performance consultants, we will make assignments for people to do some homework and then they'll bring and share it, uh, usually the first half of the program. And um, the uh, and so um, we can look if they're producing not so good examples of, uh, let's say, descriptions of work outputs or behavior or business results or metrics, then we, we know that the outputs are problematic. And so we can adjust. We can adjust fairly quickly based on that. They are therefore leading indicators because we can usually fairly quickly tell far sooner than we can if we're just waiting to get business results measures how to make some decisions. Uh, they represent the value that's delivered, which is important. And that's usually a lot easier to monitor work outputs than behavior because many of them are concrete. They're, many of them are actual permanent products. Uh, you can even shift your learning objectives, which typically people think about learning objectives as about behavior, to uh, to work outputs. In fact, here's an example from a biotech company. We might have behavioral objectives that people say, well, explain a bioreactor inoculation process or use Microsoft Excel or set up the bio labeler. These are a bunch of behaviors that you might have people doing. But if you look on the right side, those are what those behaviors should produce. And so we can monitor that. We can check those off. We can measure those. We can see is the bioreactor Meet, meet criteria? Is it got the media and the cells and is it all, you know, proper temperature and all that? Or does this budget fit our usual template? Does it meet the requirements for a good budget around here? So we can look at these outputs and we can use those actually to diagnose and assess learning uh, in training uh, sessions. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for measuring uh, work outputs, but to respond to Lisa's question, uh, they are about value, whereas behavior is about cost, really. It costs us to support behavior. What we want is for that behavior to produce things that are valuable. And also because they're leading indicators. Those are two pretty compelling reasons to, to focus on outputs. So as Bob Redeker, who's one of our most senior colleagues, he's a senior performance consultant at Insperity. He's been, he's been certified to deliver our programs, both our coaching program and our, and our uh, practitioner performance consulting program for years. And he just says it very simply. He says, if we can get clear with our clients about work outputs and criteria for good ones, they can do measurement easily by accounting work outputs. Now, I discovered something recently that might be relevant to some people. It's kind of current, which is, you know, we've got we've got Covey the third now. We had uh, we had Stephen Covey many years ago becoming famous and wealthy based on the uh, seven disciplines of extremely effective people. And then we had uh, Stephen Covey Jr. produce the book, among other things, I guess, called uh, The Speed of Trust. And now we got Sean Covey with some co-authors producing a book, The Four Disciplines of Execution. And honestly, the book to me is probably doesn't require as many pages as it has to make these points. But I was introduced to it recently, actually, by a, a vice president of sales at a company that we're starting to work with. And what the four disciplines are is focus on wildly important goals. And that's a message for executives as much as anything. Don't be too scattered. Focus on the stuff that's most important for you, for the business or for the enterprise. But the second and third and fourth ones are what are very interesting. Act on leading measures. Because if you've got leading measures, if you've got leading indicators, you can make decisions more often on a very regular basis. And if you keep a scorecard, to use his language, where your daily, weekly, very frequently looking at those leading measures, you can make not only good decisions, but as it says, you can create a cadence of accountability. And this applies to coaching an individual. If you're looking at stuff that you can check on a daily or weekly basis and provide feedback and, and help, or if you're looking at a process, or if you're looking at 
training or anything else where performance is involved, if you look at those leading indicators and we would vote for work outputs as being the easiest ones to look at, uh, then you've got a way to do this. So actually we told the VP of sales that our approach, our way of thinking about this gives a vehicle for executing the fourth, the four disciplines of execution. Um, so let me just show you a few examples. Uh, here's some dollars. So what we're counting here is dollars per month. And this is for an individual contractor, but the um, the uh, change was just a way that uh, he he changed the way he contracted and billed for people. And so the same trend continued, but it just was less variable. Uh, here's a customer service representative. Uh, these are actually this is uh, this is average in a call center, and this is for a program we did many years ago where. Um, they were basically measuring first call resolutions, solutions provided per hour across the call center. And what they learned was in the program that they had been doing for some years, which are represented by the open boxes, that is what the first call resolutions, the solutions per hour looked like after training. So not it started at about, I guess, about six a minute looks like and actually decelerated a little bit. But our fluency based uh, uh, instructional and coaching program that we introduced in the call center, um, the, the people that went through that program, as you can see with the black dots, accelerated not only from right after training, but they kept improving. They actually beat the benchmark by 60%. You can see that by monitoring these outputs. Here's some outputs of a web master. The green ones are web uh, hits. The black ones are unique visitors. So this is a way to count stuff over time which is the out valuable outputs of that web designer, webmaster. Here's just a behavioral checklist. It isn't represented as a graph, but this is some of the stuff for customer service reps you might be checking off as you are listening to and observing and working with a customer service rep. Uh, and here's some fluent behavior. This is for some also customer service people. The dots which are accelerating is in a daily practice activity of responding to key questions and facts on practice materials, and the X's are their error, arrows. And what's cool about this is you could represent this by percentage correct, but you wouldn't have anything to count. You wouldn't know what you were counting. Here, we're actually looking at the increasing accuracy because the correct responses are going up and the errors are going down, but we're actually looking at performance in real time. And then finally, here's uh, some behavior uh, self-recorded by a manager who wanted to become a more positive influence on his team. So he started counting how many times he made positive comments to people and found stuff they were doing that was good and how many times it was corrective. And what you can see is in a period of a couple of weeks, he dramatically accelerated. He moved from being kind of a critic guy to being a pretty positive player. And this is an example, just one example of measuring behavior. So sort of the bottom line here is that, um, when you're thinking about measurement, once you have analyzed some performance, whether it's for process improvement or training or performance consulting of some kind, analyze that performance into the behavior, the products of that behavior and the business results, and think about what would be the best thing to use. So for example, will it support frequent decisions? In most cases, your business results data will be important but they are such lagging indicators that you can't make very frequent decisions, maybe quarterly if you're lucky. Um, are they easy to collect? Because if you can't collect the data fairly easily, you probably won't sustain that measurement as to, to guide your intervention. And also, do they support the business case? In other words, is, for example, if you, if you decide on some work outputs, are those valuable work outputs, which if you can see change in, the good ones, it will be obvious to whoever your stakeholders are. So those are just some ways to consider it. But what we're proposing here is that the performance chain is a very useful framework for identifying measurement. And so here's some takeaways, and I'm just about done here. One of them is percent get rid of percent correct if you can. It's It doesn't tell us almost anything about performance. It's a really bad way to measure anything, even though we've all been living with it for most of our lives. Um, don't do voodoo math with rating scales. Do it the Amazon way. Actually, keep track of how many people say this, you know, rate you. Yes, you will be able to access the recording, Erica. You'll be getting uh, a link to the recording in about a, by tomorrow evening, basically. Um, Kirkpatrick's model, everybody thinks it's cool, 
but I frankly think it's yes, less useful than it seems on the surface. And I actually think that the elements of performance defined by the performance chain, behavior, work outputs, and business results give us things to count and give us a way to actually look at what part of performance is most useful. And of course, our bias is outputs, if you can find them, because it's easier, it's the value and so forth. Um, and as I said, work outputs are often leading indicators, so they support decision making. And then choose your measures based on how easy it is to actually collect them over time. So uh, that's, you know, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Uh, here's a bunch of resources. But I wonder uh, if you guys have questions or comments in the chat box. Uh, I'd love to see uh, what you think about the last 55 minutes if you're still hanging with me here. And I think most of you are. So what do you think? So I'm just responding to Erica's uh, question. Yes, we, you will get a copy of the recording. Um, any other uh, any other comments or questions in here? All right. So Chris is interested. Oh, that's fantastic. You you sign up for our practitioner program. Um, man, this is great. We've got a great lot of great people here. So questions, comments. Um, what do you think? My uh, my work outputs for this ought to be responses from uh, from participants, but it, I'm not sure if you guys are uh, inclined to ask questions or make comments. Do you have a preferred or suggested data visualization software? I don't, Chris. Um, you know, I sh the graphs that I showed you there were from a methodology or a tool set called the standard acceleration chart, which which I was introduced to early on. It was invented by Dr. Ogden Lindsley, who was a student of B.F. Skinner. And it's a beautiful way to look at count per time of anything. Uh, but there's right now no easy online version for business people and so forth. Although if you're involved in the educational or the behavior analysis world, uh, for example, a company called Chartlytics has a tool. There's also, you can, on your iPad, you can go to, you can look up a free app called uh, Aimstar Lite but most people in the business world are not using uh, uh, using iPads for their data. Um, oh, you're still seeing the poll results? <laughs> oh, geez, I'm sorry. Uh, I should reset it and get rid of that poll. Um, thank you, I didn't get that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Aimstar Lite is a good tool um, for a lot of applications. So I'm just looking at your comments. Audience, you're presenting to meeting, uh, oops, when you review progress with clients. Yep, that's certainly true. How do you define the count of words written per minute, accomplishment or behavior? Well, I see it as accomplishment, Luca. I, one of the beauties, you know, if you're doing precision teaching, if you're actually counting stuff and timing stuff, we always say it's easier to measure if you've got a permanent product. So I think a properly, for, you know, a properly, it, it is behavior, of course. So is the feedback, but we can define the content of that in a way that says it's a good one or not. So I think we can often define something that someone else does as really an output of our instruction or training. Um, man, I'm, there's a lot of good stuff now here. So um, aligns well with some of the ways you help people identify it from Warren. What's the purse, goals, objectives? Yeah, those are good questions. Should one start by establishing work outputs? Work out, well, in my opinion, Gabriel, you're, this is a whole conversation. If you go to our web, if you go to our um, YouTube channel, um, performancethinking.tv, you'll see a lot more on this. But what we always say is we definitely want to have the conversation with people about what's at stake about the, for the business or the organization. But then when we're looking at a hunk of performance, we want to look at what the work outputs or accomplishments are, because that's, that's actually the things that people produce that contribute to those business results. So we want to be sure we know what's at stake and we may measure that, but when we really get down to improving performance, whether it's for individuals, groups, processes, it's the products of behavior. Um, motor imitation for a low functioning individual who does demonstrating basic skills. Well, typically, Alicia, that's a whole topic that some of our precision teaching uh, colleagues could probably uh, answer better. But one of the questions I would have from an instructional design point of view when you're doing motor imitation is can you start with simple elements? In other words, as you build complex performance, it's often best to get fluent, to get really good at the smaller bits and then start to combine them. So that's just directional in response to your question. Really. Um, 
can change by the carrot operator error. <laughs> purpose, not purse. Yeah. Permanent product. Great definition. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Well, I think our time is up, everybody. And I really appreciate your participating um, in this uh, session. As I said, you're going to get uh, the link to the, um, to the video in about 36 hours. And in fact, you can go to our YouTube channel, which is where it will eventually get posted, uh, performancethinking.tv, and you can see the past recordings as well. Um, yeah, there's, yes, we do. Ken, you're right. We talk a lot about value in relation to accomplishments. Um, what we actually, we use ROI these days. Gilbert used to say that the worth of an intervention was equal to the value of the accomplishments or outputs that it produces or increases divided by the cost to produce the behavior. And these days people talk about ROI and I think it's the same quite thing. It's the return on investment is, did you get a, an increase in accomplishments uh, given that producing different behavior is costly? Yeah, I apologize for not having closed down the poll. That was not cool. Um, I didn't realize that. Anyway, thank you, everybody. I think we're done. Have a good day.